My name is Todd Munson. I am one of the computational scientists at Argonne National Laboratory. And I am one of the developers of the toolkit for advanced optimization. So as we've progressed throughout the day, we've started out with very low level uh, operations. So we've started out with, I have a system of PDEs and I've written them in the infinite dimensional forms. Then we've talked about discretizations and how we discretize those partial differential equations using either structured or unstructured meshes to produce discrete systems that we can go about solving on our computer. And then we've stepped up uh, another notch. Once I have those dis discretized systems of equations, I need to go and solve linear systems with either direct methods or indirect methods. So Krelov methods or direct methods. And then we moved a step up into nonlinear solvers, which Richard talked about a little bit earlier, where I actually need to solve my nonlinear system of equations to calculate a solution. So for this last talk this afternoon, we're gonna move up even a step further, and we're gonna talk about the so-called outer level or outer loop methods. So, and the general premise is I have a simulation that's encoded on my computer. Uh, you, as a linear, nonlinear system of equations, and I want to do something with that simulation. There's a number of things that we can do with those simulations. We could talk about sensitivity analysis. So how does a figure of merit for my simulation vary with changes in the inputs uh, to the system? We could talk about uncertainty quantification. Uh, and in forward uncertainty quantification, I have a distribution of the parameters of my problem, and I want to know the distribution of some figure of merit or figures of merit of the output of my simulation with respect to those parameters. Or you could go in the opposite direction and I have a list of observations and I wanna go from observations or distributions of observations back to what are the most likely parameters. And that introduces things like Bayesian optimization and inverse problems. For today, I am going to spend my time talking about the third part of, or the third aspect of the outer loop methods, which is the numerical optimization. So numerical optimization is what we use in for things like parameter estimation, inverse problems, and design problems. And as I said, the underlying premise is that it is given a simulation, we want to do something with that simulation. We want to tweak the simulation in some way in order to improve upon our existing design, for example, or find the parameters to match our observations in the best way possible. So now let me also say that numerical optimization and optimization in general is a very large field. Uh, you don't want to give me the floor for an extended period of time. I believe I have a five-day tutorial that I could give you. Uh, we are not going to go through nearly all of that today, and we're going to focus on a very small, narrow uh, aspect of numerical optimization. So we're only going to address a very small uh, part of numerical optimization and the things that are most relevant for, or we believe that are most relevant for you and that are available in the, uh, in the software packages that are available. In particular, I am not gonna talk about function spaces and infinite dimensional stuff and stochastic stuff or any of that stuff. We're gonna to stick to finite dimensional. We're gonna to stick to constrained and unconstrained optimization. So for those of you who need a little, uh, how many of you guys have done optimization before? Seen it in the calculus course? Okay, so we're in pretty good shape. I'll start off with a little bit of background. So what is optimization? So in a generic sense, our optimization problem is given a function f. That function f is either known as our objective function or our figure of merit. And we wanna, and that is parameterized by a set of parameters p. So the variables that we can control are the optimization variables p, which is an element of Rn. So we have n parameters. These could correspond to things like boundary conditions, or parameters or fields within your partial differential equation, or it can refer to a parameterized geometry uh, if you're gonna be doing shape optimization. Given those parameters inside of your PDE, you'll do a discretization, you'll have your system of equations, and we have our whole simulation that we wanna solve. So given those parameters, from that simulation, we calculate an objective function and say we want to optimize the lift versus drag ratio, or we wanna minimize the total energy of our system, that becomes our figure of merit, our objective function, which is just a mapping from our parameters to R. 
And then we just want to calculate the set of parameters that minimize this function. So how do we go about doing that? So in terms of minimization problems, the way we look at it typically is we make a whole lot of assumptions. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of those assumptions. And then we say that the solution is characterized by those points for which the gradient with respect to p of f of p is equal to zero. Now, if you recall from calculus, the gradient is basically the sensitivity of that function with respect to a particular parameter. So if I increase the parameter, the gradient tells me, is the function going to increase or is it going to decrease? In this particular case, we don't have any constraints on the parameters. We're not restricting the parameters to anything. So we can only be a minimizer of this function if the gradient with respect to p is equal to zero. That means that the function is neither increasing nor decreasing as we increase the values p or decrease the values p. So we have to be at a stationary point where the function is just flat. And that's how you define a minimizer. There's a couple of different types of methods that one can apply for solving these types of optimization problems. There are gradient free or derivative free optimization methods. And these basically do a search through the parameter space P. They're very easy to use. You don't need to calculate any of the sensitivities. Uh, and they can actually find pretty reasonable solutions for your optimization problems for fairly small numbers of parameters. So I would tend to focus on gradient free methods or uh, derivative free methods, typically when the number of parameters uh, is very small on the order of 10 to 100 parameters for derivative free optimization. Now, if you want a global solution for any of these problems, you have to search over the entire space. Uh, and so you have to search densely within the space, which means you'll be waiting from now until eternity to actually guarantee that you've calculated a global solution for any sort of non-convex problem. The other type of methods that we talk about and what I'll focus on today are gradient-based methods. So the gradient-based methods calculate a search direction based upon sensitivity information. So they calculate the gradient of the objective function with respect to the parameters, and they use that gradient information to derive a numerical method. These methods converge locally uh, very quickly, quadratically, typically, uh, if you're using a Newton-based method, uh, but they only core calculate local minimizers. So for a non-convex function, it has lots of you know, humps in it, the non-convexity is related to the number of humps, and the global solution is the low, absolute lowest point, and the local minimizers correspond to where you know, one of the humps is, is there. We can usually find local minima for uh, non-convex problems, but we can't guarantee that we can find global minima. As I mentioned, finding global minima requires a search uh, through the entire space that has to be densely, you have to densely search the space in P in order to guarantee that you calculate a solution. However, if you are near a minimizer that you want to find, you can apply a gradient-based method and you can find a local minimizer for that uh, function in fairly few function evalu evaluations. So the trade-off is that now you have to provide derivatives, but you converge faster. Uh, you don't pr provide derivatives and you go derivative free and your convergence rate will be much, much lower and you'll have to do a lot of evaluations. So why do we really care about optimization? Well, as I said before, we started off at the beginning with our PDE. Our PDE has a bunch of inputs, boundary conditions, parameters, your geometry. You go and discretize it and you apply a system of equations. So you're doing fluid dynamics or continuum mechanics or heat problems. You discretize that and you obtain a simulation. From the simulation, you solve a nonlinear system of equations and you get an output to the simulation, and then you apply some figure of merit. We may be looking at the distribution of densities. We may be looking at vorticity. Uh, we may be looking at all kinds of different outputs. So that's the forward problem. Forward problem starts from the inputs for the simulation, goes through all of these steps. We solve the simulation, we get the outputs, and we calculate the quantities that we're interested in. The optimization goes backwards, and we start from everything that you had before. We start from the simulation and the outputs. From the outputs, we determine the objective, which is our figure of merit, and then we go backwards to do the optimization 
And then from the optimization, it tells us what are the parameters, what are the controls, what are the decisions that we need to make in order to optimize that function uh, over the inputs that we have available. And these are typically known as inverse problems. So we have the forward pass and the reverse pass, and the reverse pass is the optimization pass. There's lots of problems that are written down as inverse problems. This is just one particular example, which is a driven cavity problem. So here, this is related to EX19 that Richard showed earlier. There's a fluid simulation. There's a cavity that you, there's a top to the cavity that you move along and you want to minimize the vorticity inside of the steady state solution for that particular problem. And we do that by varying the speed at which the, the top of the cavity moves. So in the uh, original case, you get uh, a poor solution, you optimize it, you drive the cavity in a certain way, and then you could get a nice solution. And the optimization is telling you how you drive the cavity in order to get the solution that you're most interested in. Okay, so for the rest of this particular talk, I will go through a little bit about uh, gradient-based optimization methods in general. This may be things that you have not seen before uh, unless you've taken an optimization course. And so I'll just give you a, a basic overview of some of those methods and how they relate to the nonlinear solvers and stuff that we've seen already today. Talk a little bit about sensitivity analysis, and then I'll show a little bit about the toolkit for advanced optimization which is where we have coded all of the solvers that we'll talk about today inside of Petsy, and we'll show how to use them. And then Richard will come in and give us the hands-on example using the uh, Rosenbach-Brock equations and all of the uh, notes that are online for that. Now let's see, let's start back at the beginning. So this is just a reminder from where we started from. So we have our generic numerical optimization problem. It's unconstrained. We want to find parameters P to minimize a function F of P. We have variables P and RN. We have an objective function from RN to RN. We're looking for local minimizers where the gradient is zero. And this is our optimality condition in the literature. That's the optimality condition. That's what we're searching for is those stationary points where the gradient of the objective function is equal to zero. And we're just reiterating here that that optimality condition is necessary, but is not sufficient. If you're at a local minimizer, the gradient has to be equal to zero. But if the gradient is equal to zero, it does not necessarily imply that you are at a local minimizer. You could be at a local maximizer. You could be at another stationary point or saddle point. It's only in specific cases where the optimal, that optimality condition is both necessary and sufficient. And that occurs when your objective function is basically convex. So if there's only one minimizer, which is sort of the definition of a convex function, then those optimality conditions are both necessary and sufficient in the convex case. The basic outline for uh, the algorithms for this, it comes in two parts. And I like to, to sort of state this, all good algorithms are based on Newton's method or some subset of Newton's method. So really, everything that we do and everything that we talk about in optimization in some way goes back to Newton's method. So there's two parts to the algorithm. The first part is the local method. So the local method is this part where we're going to take our problem, we're gonna find an approximation to the problem, and we're gonna iteratively solve the approximation. So in, in systems of equations, nonlinear systems of equations, that's your linearization. You solve the linearization to get a next step. Here we're gonna solve a quadratic approximation to the objective function. Uh, and from that quadratic approximation, it's gonna tell us a direction in which we're gonna go to decrease the objective function and then we're gonna go there and to do that. The local part is important because the local part tells you the rate of convergence of the method as you approach a solution. So in Newton's method, the rate of convergence is quadratic, but it's only quadratic when you get near enough to the solution or a local solution for the optimization problem. How do we ensure that we get close enough to get into that domain of local convergence where we can observe the quadratic convergence rate. That's the second part of the algorithms. Second part of the algorithms has to do with stabilization. Richard mentioned this in his talk with regards to line searches. 
Uh, that's one stabilization technique. There are trust region methods and there are other types of stabilization techniques. All the stabilization methods are doing, and sometimes you'll hear these talked about as globalization strategies. I try not to use globalization strategies because that sort of gets confused with, I'm gonna calculate a global solution. Nope. What these stabilization techniques are doing is they're ensuring that you actually get within the domain of local convergence. So that's all that the line search, trust region, or other method, stabilization method is doing. Is it's ensuring that the iterates get close enough to a local solution so that the uh, fast rate of local convergence uh, kicks in, and then you always accept the Newton step, and then you converge at a quadratic rate uh, if, you're applying, uh, if you're applying a Newton method. So how does this work? So in the optimization context, we do this by something called sequential quadratic programming. And you'll see there's two steps here. The first step is to find a direction, and the second step is to find a step length. The step length calculation is the line search that, uh, that Richard talked about earlier for the nonlinear solvers. Uh, and so I won't spend a whole lot of time on that, but that is what it is. So the first thing that we do is we apply a local method, and here we're gonna calculate a second order Taylor series approximation to the objective function. So that involves the gradient of the objective function as well as the Hessian of the objective function or the second order information. So we're gonna solve a quadratic program, minimize over the directions D, sort of F of K plus D transpose GK, where GK is the gradient at PK, plus one half DT transpo D transpose HKD. So this is a quadratic problem. So, and that is the hardest problem that we actually know how to solve uh, for many cases. So the optimality conditions for that quadratic program is simply H times D is equal to minus G. And if you go and write it down uh, and take the inverse of HK, you get a solve. So you're gonna find your direction D is equal to minus HK inverse GK. You can apply any linear system solver to that system. Uh, any solver for linear systems of equations, you could do a direct method, you could do an indirect method. The thing to keep in mind here is HK is symmetric. Uh, and because HK is symmetric, instead of doing an LU factorization, you use a Cholesky factorization. And instead of a standard Krelov method, you might use something like, well, you would use conjugate gradients or one of the other stabilized conjugate gradient methods with a trust region for various uh, types of problems. So our solution is determined by solving a linear system of equations, which is symmetric. We find a direction. We do a search along that direction to minimize our function, phi of alpha. So it's a function of a single parameter alpha uh, to find the step length. So we wanna minimize over alpha, f of pk plus alpha times d, D is what we just calculated, and now we want to determine the step length to minimize the function along the direction. Update the iterates, and we continue along. All of these steps inside of the sequential quadratic programming method can be done approximately. There is no need to solve them exactly. So in particular, we only need the direction that has a sufficient, satisfies a sufficient decrease condition. We only need an alpha that reduces the objective function sufficiently, and then we could keep iterating. So, and as I said, the local method, the first part is what is providing fast local convergence. The line search is what's providing the stabilization to ensure that you get within the domain of local convergence. This is generic sequential quadratic programming. There's lots of flavors of sequential quadratic programming that you can come up with. And these are all implemented in the packages that we talk about. There's different approximations that yield different search directions and different rates of convergence. So Newton's method, for example, uses the exact Hessian matrix. So if you use the exact Hessian matrix, there's no approximation to HK. We're using HK directly. We solve a linear system of equations to get the direction. And then eventually, under suitable conditions, we are going to get quadratic convergence to a local solution. If you don't want to provide a Hessian matrix, is there's things that you can do with just gradients. Yes, there are things that you can do with just the gradient of the objective function. There are these things called quasi-Newton methods, which replace HK by an approximation. And in this case, we are using a uh, BK, a limited memory BFGS approximation to HK. 
These approximations are typically based upon a secant condition, and there's all kinds of, of conditions and implementations of quasi-Newton methods, and it's a whole family of methods. Uh, and all that they're doing is they're replacing the HK with an approximation BK. That approximation in general, or in you hope, converges to the actual uh, HK uh, in the limit. It may not always do that, but that's what you hope for. And from that, you can derive a superlinear rate of convergence. There's another method called the conjugate gradient method, which doesn't have this matrix in there anymore, and it just uses gradients. So it uses past gradient, it uses the current gradient information in the past direction, combines those two together to get a new direction using this uh, parameter beta. And the definition of the beta determines the conjugate gradient method that you're using. And there's a whole family of conjugate gradient methods, and there's three-step conjugate gradient methods, and there's conjugate gradient methods that look like quasi-Newton methods, and so on and so forth. There's tons of these things all over the place if you read the literature. And so you define families of these methods, and then you can go and play around with the families. And then the simplest gradient-based method is just simple gradient descent. So here we uh, get rid of HK and we replace it by the identity matrix, and that just gives us that the direction is the negative gradient. That's the simplest one to do, but it's also the one that provides the worst in terms of convergence, so it provides at most a linear rate of convergence. I think you could get super linear in some cases, but in general you get about a linear rate of convergence. Okay? So all of these methods would be implemented and provided for you inside of the, one of the linear algebra packages. And we'll talk about the toolkit for advanced optimization and what it provides there. How is this related to a simulation? So far we have not seen anything related to the simulation here. And what we're gonna do in terms of the simulation is that this is PDE constrained optimization. In this particular case, we have an optimization problem in two variables. We have the state variables uh, u and the parameters p. And we also have an equation here. That equation is your simulation. It's a function of the parameters p, and it tells you the unique solution to the state variables u. What you can do is you can go and transform this using the implicit function theorem into an optimization problem just in the parameters. And the way that this is formulated is it's to minimize over p, f of p, u of p, where u is the solution to the uh, simulation as a function of the parameters p. And now, when you want to calculate gradients, you get the gradient of f of x. In order to do that, you need to know the gradient of u uh, with respect to p, and the way you calculate that is via an adjoint or a sensitivity of, sensitivity of your PDE solution to the parameters p. And so if you want more information on how we do PDE constrained optimization and alternate strategies for solving PDE constrained optimization problems, you can go and look at the ADPEST 2019 lesson for more details on this. All of the methods that we have are encoded in the toolkit for advanced optimization. This is part of the portable extensible toolkit for scientific computing. Uh, and this is a less fancy version of the picture that, uh, that uh, Richard provided where we have all of our lower level objects, our vectors and matrices, they get built up into linear solvers and then into nonlinear solvers and then at the outer level to tau. So tau provides all of the PETSI data structures. It supports parallel solutions uh, via the PETSI data structures. It supports GPUs via the PETSI data structures. It contains all kinds of gradient based methods all of the methods that we talked about before in terms of Newton methods, as well as conjugate gradient methods and uh, limited memory variable metric methods and BFGS methods and DFP methods and blah, 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 blah. And then it also supports general nonlinear and linear constraints uh, and it solves, is able to solve PDE constrained optimization problems. You can go and find this in Petsy. It's in the, uh, it's in the uh, distribution of Petsy, and it's compiled along with Petsy whenever you uh, configure and make Petsy. It's automatically compiled there. There are similar optimization packages in the XSDK. These include the Rapid Optimization Library out of Sandia, uh, and that is part of Trilinos, and then the High op Optimization Package out of Lawrence Livermore, and all of those packages uh, can be go. You can go and look at them and download them if Tau or Petsy doesn't satisfy the needs that you have. The basics of solving an optimization problem in tau is very simple. We initialize Petsy. 
we create some vectors, we create a tau object, we set the objective function and the gradient, and those are in those tau set objective and tau set gradient. We solve, we call the solve routine to just solve the problem. We get the solution and then we close everything out. So the form function and form gradient, those are callback functions that you provide that tell us your figure of merit and the gradient of the figure of merit. So you provide these and they're provided with an app context and then they have a functional form where you go and you take a tau object, a vector, you return the uh, actual uh, figure of merit that you're interested in, and you do that in the standard Petsy ways. The same thing with the gradient, although the gradient now is a vector, and you can also use the Hessian using the tau set Hessian uh, routine here. So from the user's perspective, it really is the objective function value and the gradient for the unconstrained cases. For second order methods, you can set the Hessian matrix. Uh, and if you really want to get into more advanced topics, which I'll mention in a little bit, you can have uh, constraints, bound constraints, lower and upper bounds on the parameters, as well as nonlinear and linear constraints, uh, both inequalities and equalities uh, on the parameters themselves. We often get asked quite a bit about the sensitivity analysis. So we need to be able to calculate the gradient G, which is a gradient of with respect to P of F at a given P. This is really uh, what we really do like to have for optimization problems if you wanna get uh, reasonably fast convergence for very large problems. Part of that is that all of the optimality conditions are based upon accurate evaluations of the gradient and then the numerical methods themselves are based on the gradient. There's two basic ways to calculate the sensitivities. You can do numerical differences or finite differences. This is the standard finite difference uh, scheme. And just vary the parameters. We calculate the outputs of the objective function for both the original set of parameters and the perturbed parameters. We divide and we get a finite difference approximation for the gradient. This is very simple to do, very easy to implement, and it's automatically available inside of tau uh, using finite difference gradients as well as finite difference Hessian evaluations. It requires a lot of function evaluation, so in general it's gonna be very inefficient if you have a large number of parameters. And then the step size calculation can also be problematic. And there you have to choose the step size in order to weight your truncation error versus your cancellation errors. There are good ways to choose the step size and you could go and do some searches for those types of methods and go and find them. Uh, all of that stuff is available inside of Tau, which all does automatic, uh, automatically does finite difference uh, derivatives. The best way to get derivatives for uh, large problems is to do it either symbolically or via algorithmic differentiation. Here you're basically going to be using the rules of calculus uh, to derive the gradients uh, for the function with respect to the parameters P. You can either do that from the math side, from the symbols that you use in order to write down your equations, or you can do it from the code. And if you do it from the code, that gives you this algorithmic differentiation, which uses a source code transformation or operator overloading to calculate the uh, gradient via the chain rule. There are a bunch of automatic differentiation or algorithmic differentiation tools available for your use if you uh, decide to go that route. Uh, Addisi, Adafor, Cicado, Jax, all kinds of things in there for calculating uh, uh, analytic derivatives. The reason why we prefer analytic derivatives is that the computational cost of the analytic derivatives is mostly independent of the number of variables. So if you use the reverse mode of automatic differentiation, you can get the gradient uh, within a factor of, I think it's five or 10 of the number of function evaluations independent of the number of parameters that you have. And then those gradients are also accurate. You don't have to worry about step sizes or anything like that. They're all accurate to machine precision. Okay, so that's for the unconstrained case. In terms of the bound constrained case, what if you know that, oh, my temperature has to be non-zero? Uh, or my pressure has to be greater than 200 millibars. So the way you do that within tau is you could add bound constraints on the parameters, and that just changes the optimization problem. So instead of minimizing over P unrestricted, we now have P between lower and upper bounds. 
And for some reason, I changed to X, and I don't know why. OK. The way this is done is we just set lower and upper bounds. So we have two vectors, XL and XU. We set XL to some value. We set XU to some value. And then we call this tau set variable bounds. And now suddenly, my parameters are now constrained to be between their lower and upper bounds. Most of the algorithms that we use inside of tau independent of whether you have bounds or not, actually go and revert and use the bound constrained versions. We do that in order to reduce the amount of replicated code inside of Petsy. So there is really not inside of Petsy an unconstrained Newton method. It's always a bound constrained Newton method. The optimality conditions change when you switch to bound constraints, and it really has to do with the gradient of the objective function. Uh, if you're at the lower bound, the gradient of the objective function has to be in point in an increasing direction. So if I'm at the lower bound, the function has to be increasing. If I'm at the upper bound, the objective function has to be decreasing. And there's a bunch of algorithms available inside of Tau for solving these. Uh, Newton and two flavors, a trust region flavor and a line search flavor. Those are different uh, globalization strategies. And we have all of the uh, conjugate gradient and quasi-Newton methods, as well as steepest ascent methods that you may want to have. We can do things more in general with general nonlinear constraints. So here we've added equality and inequality constraints as well as bound constraints. And then there's an augmented Lagrangian method that uses an interpoint point formulation inside of tau for solving these problems. And all this really does here is that we add some extra constraints into our problem. We provide functions or the user provides functions to form the equality constraints and the Jacobian of the equality constraints and then the inequality constraints and the Jacobian of the inequality constraints. And we separate those because you have to treat them differently inside of the optimization problems. At this point, we are going to transition into doing a little bit of the hands-on examples. And I'll just provide a brief overview of the hands-on examples. And then Richard is going to show them off for me, please. Uh, so the uh, first example will just be a simple two-dimensional Rosenbrock function. This is a uh, typical problem that we use for testing uh, inside of the numerical optimization. It's a function of exactly one variable, P1, and it happens to be a fairly difficult problem to, to solve. So you'll see that how difficult it is. There's a global solution at, at the point 1, 1. So I, I, I apologies. There's two parameters, P1 and P2. Uh, so there's a global solution at 1, 1. It's very hard to find that solution because there's this shallow curve that goes around the outside of it. And because it's so shallow, uh, you get stuck, and you get stuck, and you get stuck. And eventually, you'll get there, but it will take a long time. So it's easy to find the valley, but it's hard to actually get to the solution because the valley is fairly shallow, and you just start iterating back and forth among it. And then the second problem will be the multidimensional Rosenbrock function, which takes the original Rosenbrock function and just increases the size of it. So now instead of two variables, we have n variables. Uh, the global minimization, the global minimizer is as before. It's at one for all of the variables. Uh, this particular implementation of the Rosenbrock function supports uh, all the parallelism. You can do it with multiple, uh, multiple cores and things like that. The sensitivities in this case can be calculated via finite differencing. Uh, and I think that this one actually uses the uh, finite differences. This hands-on activities can be found by uh, going to the lesson. And then the third example that we'll go through is the 2D Rosenbrock function with the constraints. And here it's the 2D Rosenbrock function. And we've just added bounds on the uh, parameters. So P1 is less than or equal to 0. P2 is greater than or equal to 0. And that gives you the box shape in the corner. And then we have an equality constraint. P1 minus 1 squared plus P2 minus 3 is equal to 0. And that gives you the parabola. And so we're looking for solutions that are in the intersection of the upper left-hand corner with the line for the parabola. And so there's two possibilities. Uh, and those possibilities occur at those two points. One of those is the global solution. And, and that is what we'll be doing for the second one, just to show you a little bit about the uh, equality constraints. So at this point, I will have Richard come up and help me out with this part.
Okay, uh, so I am going to be doing the, uh, the hands-on demo because uh, Todd is missing his token generator to log into Theta. So that's why the, the sudden and unexpected switch. <laughs> but I may need Todd to like uh, explain what's going on or, or something like that. Okay, let's see. So Todd, we're supposed to be starting from the, uh, the, the, this, this part, right? The multidimensional Rosenbrock. Okay, so the multidimensional Rosenbrock uh, binary should actually just be in your uh, track five numerical uh, examples directory. And if it's, if it's not, uh, make sure to rsync that directory over again. I don't know when this got added. It wasn't here earlier last night, but I, I got added at some point. Okay. All right, so we're just supposed to run this with all the defaults and we'll, we'll ask uh, Tau to print out the monitoring information. And actually, are, are you still mic'd up, Todd? Do you, want, do you want to talk to any of these examples? Because Todd actually knows a bunch about these algorithms and I don't. But. Okay, so uh, depending upon if, I, if I'm on the microphone. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you go up a little bit further, so this is the output that you would typically find from tau. The residual here is the two norm of the gradient in this particular case. And the objective function value is the objective function value that we had in terms of the problem. So we start fairly far away from the solution. We've got a very large objective function value and a large residual. And as you can see, as we go down closer and closer, we take a lot of iterations in this particular case because this is a fairly hard problem. The objective function value 10 is going to decrease. So this is a monotone method. So the objective function value will decrease from iteration to iteration. Uh, well, you'll notice that the residual bounces around. So it's perfectly natural for the residual to increase and decrease. And then if you go down a little bit further, so and then here you'll notice at about iteration 45, I believe you start getting into the domain of local convergence. So here you go at about iteration number 43 is where it starts. So our residual is 0 0.01, and then it goes to 0 0.002, and then 0 0.0001, then 10 to the minus 7, and 10 to the minus 12. So it starts off at a sort of linear convergence rate, and then it quickly accelerates into the quadratic convergence rate until you get to the solution after 47 iterations, uh, which is right there. And then our objective function value is 0. OK? OK. All right, uh, do you want to speak to any of this stuff or? <laughs> I'll let you speak to it. <laughs> okay, well, um, for, for those of you who, at, who were able to attend my talk, um, the, uh, the, these, these tau examples are um, a lot like the other Petsy examples that I showed where you, know, you can control a whole lot of the stuff that's going on at, at runtime. Uh, I had talked about how in, um, in my nonlinear example, how uh, you could, the user can specify analytical Jacobians or uh, have them be calculated by finite differences. You can do that with, uh, with gradients here by specifying dash FD. Uh, and there are also some things uh, particular yeah, to these. The other types yeah. of problems that we have. Yeah, okay. Okay, and so then there is a, a bunch of hands-on activities uh, here that are um, let's see, a bit more structured towards people just playing with them than running through a demo than what I did, but I can run through some of these. Yeah, why don't you run with uh, BNCG? I okay. Just change the tau type to BNCG. Okay, yeah, so the default is tau type BNCG. What's the default, Todd? That I think you it's BNCG. Okay. But we'll see in a second. Okay, so that's BNCG, takes even longer. You'll notice that you're only getting a linear rate of convergence with BNCG, that's the conjugate gradient method. Okay, yep, all right. 
takes longer, and then the NLS is the uh, nonlinear solver. Yeah, that's the Newton solver with the line search. It takes less iterations and it has your quadratic rate. And if you change it to BNTR, oh. it'll switch it to the uh, trust region method, BNTR. And the trust region method takes even less time. It's using a different stabilization strategy, but it's still using the basic Newton solvers there. And so you could play around with the types of methods. Generally, when you go from a gradient-based method to a Hessian-based method, you can expect to get faster convergence rates and hopefully take less time, but that's not always a given. All right, um, so the next thing in here is to try increasing the problem size and impact its in, and evaluate its impact on convergence. So, uh, Todd, what, uh, which, uh, which tau type? Use TR. Use TR. And like my uh, BNTR. BN, yeah, BNTR and dash. And uh, 50 or something like that. Let's see. Wait. Um, increase the problem size with? Minus N. Okay. Just to 50? Yeah, let's try, well, let's try 10. Okay, 10. So that takes that about 49 iterations. If you go larger, it's going to take more iterations. And so what we can say is that the Newton method here is, is not, uh, it's not scaling in terms of the problem size. Uh, you can go and change that potentially using a grid sequencing type method or a multi-grid method. Uh, but in general, the optimization problems, we try to make them scalable, but they're not always as scalable as you would like in terms of the problem size. All right, now we should try doing it with finite differences. Uh, should I keep it at Yeah, 50? sure, minus FD. And now it takes even longer because the gradient is not as accurate as you would like it to be. And so when you get an inaccurate gradient or Hessian information, that reduces the rate of convergence for the methods. And now you should solve it with lots of processors. Let's see. Let's run the same problem with, with eight, eight cores. And then how big should N be? Let's just see what happens just if we try it with 50. I think that's fine. So let's that see. Did. That was 2 point, what, it was, it was 2.64 seconds for this time. If we run it on one, what do we get? <laughs> so this tells us something about. We need your flame plot. Problem sizing and and being in the strong, the, the limits of the strong scaling regime. Yep. Uh, but I bet that we can make tau, we can make tau faster <laughs> than, than the... Uh, Change it to like 500 and use, uh, get rid of the FT. Okay, and so let's see what happens if we try that on one core. No, nope, still faster, Todd. But. I don't know what to tell you. I got nothing for that one. 5,000 maybe? Yeah, I, I don't actually know what this, um, I don't know what this, uh, what this 5,000 really means. It's 5,000 variables. Oh, okay. It's the size of the problem. Okay, moment of truth. Wow, 
Wow, this is not pretty. Hmm. Was it was it bouncing around the, the residual bouncing, bouncing around. around as much when we ran it on eight cores? No, it was not. So there's something going on with the linear algebra here. Uh, we Different can find sequences out. Yeah, of the let, Let's see what it's doing actually. You could probably just kill it. Let's see. So okay, we, we wonder about what's going now. If I do like a if I do a tau view, will this sort of tell me more about sure. what's the, what? Okay, like what what's going on? Oh, well, it's going to run. It's going to run the whole thing and then show me what what the solver is. It's going to take forever. See that time? Look, if you go back up, it didn't take nearly as long. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So there's something going on in the way it assembles the uh, matrices. It's the random additions and subtractions. So it's getting some truncation or other error, depending upon the, uh, the order in which the operations are done. Let's see. But I do believe, no, you did eight for this one. If you go back to one, that's the one where it's gonna go and take forever. Yeah, although, uh, let's see, I, it, won't, it won't tell us what, I was trying to figure out how the, you know, if it's running the exact same tau solve or if it's doing something different because we're running on multiple MPI. No, it's doing the same solve. Same solver. thing? Okay, all right. Let's go back and do a, the next one. Okay. <laughs> we'll just ignore that. You saw nothing. <laughs> so then let's just run it with the bounded, the uh, minus bounded minus EQ, and that you have to go back to two. So n equals two. N equals two, and then what were you supposed to do? Dash bound. Minus bound and minus eq. Minus eq. Uh, oh. And let's see. Should we do this on? Well, let's just try it on one core. Woohoo. Okay. What did that? What did that tell us, Todd? Well, so we, uh, I think we need to go back to n equals 1. Or just get rid of the minus n. Okay. It tells us we calculated a solution, <laughs> I guess. Uh, okay. Okay, and if you go into the code, you can go and look at this and change things around. And there's other examples later on that you can go and run, I believe, for PD constrained stuff. Let's see. So are you saying that I should open this up in the editor or? No, I think we're good. Okay. Um, is, is you just want to, uh, shall I stop running demo stuff yeah, now or because so. there's, there's actually, you know, there, there are a bunch of things that, that people can feel free to just try. Yep. There's plenty of stuff here. that you can just go and try. Let me uh, give you a little bit of the takeaway messages. Okay. Just as our final takeaway messages from the demo and from what we talked about today. So we do have these methods for solving numerical optimization problems inside of Tau and in some of the other packages. These can go to fairly large scale problems. So we only looked at problems on, uh, on one uh, node, but they can go to multiple nodes. They can use the GPUs and you could go to actually fairly large scale problems. For the best results, you really do need good gradients. Uh, so we prefer uh, either algorithmic differentiation or symbolic differentiation to get those gradients. Uh, the other thing to note here is that the second order method, so the Newton methods aren't necessarily always the fastest in terms of total time to solution. So sometimes the gradient based methods, the nonlinear conjugate gradient method or the quasi Newton method can give you a faster solution, uh, at least if you don't want a highly accurate solution. And that's because the linear algebra you do inside of a quasi Newton method or a conjugate gradient method is much less than the linear algebra you do for a 
uh, a Newton-based method where you have to solve that linear system of equations at every iteration. We do have methods that automatically calculate the gradients via finite differencing. That should be your backstop. So if you don't have anything else, you can do it via finite differencing. Uh, but the preference really is to go and provide the sensitivities, uh, either via algorithmic differentiation or symbolic differentiation. We can incorporate bounds and all kinds of constraints into the problem that increases the complexity of the problem and it will generally take longer to solve a problem with bounds and all kinds of constraints than it will uh, to solve a, an unconstrained problem. So, and then the last part here is that a lot of the problems that you'll encounter are both nonlinear and non-convex, so they'll have multiple local solutions. And in those cases, the starting point matters. So if you change the starting point, you can change the solution that you'll uh, get to. And that's the uh, basis for multi-start methods and other types of global optimization methods is the sampling over the space uh, in order to calculate uh, a lot of local solutions and then return the best ones that they uh, find. But that really is a problem with those non-convex problems and the nonlinear problems. And then let me just end that this is all available inside of Petsy. So you could go down to and download Petsy from Petsy.org, get it from the GitLab repository. And if you have questions with Petsy or Tau or uh, any of the optimization aspects, you could email the Petsy users group uh, at Argon, or you can email me directly for any of the numerical optimization uh, content. And with that, we will end this particular session. You can play around with the examples some more. And then I believe everybody is going to be coming back in here in a little bit for the final closing session and then some additional unstructured time. Yeah, I was just trying to, uh, do you think there may be some uh, formal connection between, like, for example, the, uh, the Newton method right. and the, the frequency? So there are preconditioned methods. So we didn't get to talk about the preconditioners, but you, the sequential quadratic programming method itself, you can go and precondition it. And it basically adds a, a matrix to the left and the right side of the H term. So you switch it into a, a preconditioned space. You basically switch the norm to an M norm is basically what goes on. Uh, so you can do all the preconditioning that you would normally do with the conjugate gradient method. You just need to make sure that your preconditioner uh, remains symmetric and positive definite, uh, which is what you normally have to have for, for the precondition system. Formally, are there, are, there, are there equivalent? And yeah, some... there is a formal equivalence between the precondition CG and changing the space. Uh, so basically, you change the space of the optimization variables. So you switch to y is equal to m negative one half x, or I think it's m to the negative one half x, and then you just do that change of variables. So, so in terms of convergence, that's in terms of convergence, it's the same convergence rates. Although empirically, you can observe faster convergence because you're basically changing the space and you're changing the way that the the length of the directions in the appropriate ways. Uh, are there any proofs? So you will not find a proof that they're the most optimal ways. So you have to do that empirically because it depends really on the problem. It also depends upon how accurate you want your solution. So if you don't need a, an, a solution that's accurate to you know, 10 digits, that if you only need a solution that's accurate to two digits, Typically, a nonlinear conjugate gradient method or a quasi-Newton method will give you a solution, uh, a solution that's accurate to two digits in less time than it'll take you to solve one of the, the Newton methods. Uh, the benefits of the Newton methods is that it will give you eventually that those ten digits of accuracy. You know. Yep. When you have multiple values in your solution, uh, is there a way to use different proofs to search different parts of spaces? Uh, so, can you repeat the question uh, for me? When you have multiple values, many local minimums, yep. uh, can you use different nodes or codes or GPUs to search different parts of the space? So, you could. Uh, Petsy is not set up to do that uh, for you, but you know, you can submit multiple jobs or you can have multiple different executables that do that. I have one more question. Yep. Um, 
what's the limit on the number of unknowns you can have? What's the limit uh, on the number of unknowns you can have? Uh, so, for a nicely formulated problem, and for a nice problem, the only limits that are there will be your patience and the amount of memory you have and the amount of computing power that you have. So in general, the scalability of the linear systems goes with the scalability of the linear systems themselves. So if you have a good linear system solver, if you're able to scalably solve the linear systems, then the rest of the optimization bits around the linear solver are, are very simple. Uh, we still need to calculate norms and stuff, so that may be your limiting factor in terms of the size is how long are you willing to wait for the norms to, to be calculated. Yes? Uh, so this is a, like a black box, optimi black box optimization method, right? Like we need our forward solver to compute the gradient efficiency by applying. Right. So in terms of black box solvers, so the black box solvers are those for which you have don't have any derivative information. So that's the derivative free methods. Those are typically sampling based. So those are things like uh, derivative free optimization methods, simulated annealing methods, ant colony optimization methods, evolutionary algorithms, those sorts of things. Those tend to be what we talk about for black box methods. So you can apply those. There are a a small number of them in there for Petsy. Uh, I think there's pounders and one other one in there for Petsy. Those don't require any gradient information, but you're sacrificing in terms of convergence rates. So it'll calculate a reasonable solution, but you can't provide guarantees on how close you are to a, a, a local minimizer in those particular cases, but they don't require derivatives. So what we talk about here is mainly the white box methods which provide those derivative information. So you need, your simulation needs to provide the gradients for us. There is a third class, which is these gray box methods. These are typically for structured problems where you know some structure analytically that I'm minimizing a two norm, for example, and I model the two norm in a different way from the black box function on the inside. And those are called gray box methods because they provide a limited amount of information analytically and then a limited and then the rest of the information via the black box function. I have one follow-up question. So sometimes people use edge joints to compute sensitivity for. Yep. So like, is, I guess in that case, do we have to like have our own edge joint solver and kind of, is there a capability to adding to add that? So inside of Petsy, there is this whole notion of the time steppers that we didn't get to talk about today, the TS methods. This is in sundials as well. Uh, those uh, time steppers have ways to calculate the adjoints for you. And what they typically need is the gradient of the right-hand side. And then they'll go and they'll do the backward calculation to compute the adjoints. So thank you.